We're beginning our series on the Greater Romantic Lyric with Samuel Taylor Coleridge's Frost at Midnight, one of the most beautiful long poems that we have in English, and one of the most artistically coherent poems that Coleridge wrote. He wrote this in February 1798 when he was friends with Wordsworth. It was an intense period of collaboration between the two. And this one was written first, but we'll see in Wordsworth's poem, Tintern Abbey, that Wordsworth will draw upon many of the lyrical turns that are happening in this poem. This is called a conversation poem, which uh, Coleridge actually invented. This uh, form usually consists of blank verse, which is unrhymed iambic pentameter lines. So we see that each line has roughly five stressed syllables in iambic pentameter. And it's written in a conversational mode, in an idiomatic language. We'll see that it starts out uh, with, with a scene and an address to someone as though he's addressing us as a confidant, as a friend. And so that's one of the marks of the conversation poems. Certainly, uh, this is one of the greater romantic lyrics that enacts this movement out, in, and out again. We'll see here in the beginning how the meter is mostly iambic, but like Wordsworth and Tintern Abbey, the first line is not strict iambic pentameter. We'll see here, the frost performs its secret ministry. See, here's an iamb, unstressed stress. There's one unit, there's the second, there's the third. Then we have something here, another iamb, and then a pyrrhic, which is two unstressed syllables. But notice how it starts to fall away. The frost performs its secret ministry. It's kind of moving into the secret. This, this idea of, of secret, which comes from uh, the Latin set apart, separate, um, isolated, or obscure. And these poems, they often begin in a state of extreme isolation and then move out into community. And of course, it has this connotation as well of secret is reserved, um, unknown or mysterious. And it's performing, laying the crust of hoarfrost and perhaps the little icicles on the window is it's, it's, it's performing. And so this, this poem itself is very interested in performance and form of its own ministry of how the, the words like the frost are moving across the page and how they're unfolding. Here we have this in the present tense. Notice this present tense verb. So we are very much in the moment with him, unhelped by any wind. The owlet's cry came loud. Notice this past tense. He's describing a prior event. So we're moving into the past with this verb came loud. And hark, again, loud as before, this present command. So he's, we're there with him in the parlor, by the fire, the ministry of the frost is being performed outside. The owlet's cry came loud, and then immediately it's here again. We have this word, this will be important for Wordsworth's Tintern Abbey as well. Loud as before. And so you have this temporal modulation within the first three lines where you, you're in the moment, and then you're recalling the previous event, the cry of the owl, and then it comes again. And really, this encapsulates what the poem itself will do, as we'll see. The inmates of my cottage, all at rest, have left me to that solitude, which suits abstruser musing. Here, the topic of meditation is being broached. Save or accept that at my side, my cradled infant slumbers peacefully. Tis calm indeed, so calm that it disturbs and vexes meditation with its strange and extreme silentness. This is such a striking word where we would expect silence. He uses the word silentness to emphasize the strangeness of this absence of sound. The word choice is kind of vexing. We, we expect silence, but instead we have this, this other, almost unnatural expression of it which highlights just how strange and extreme this silentness is. Sea, hill, and wood, this populous village, sea and hill and wood. Notice how this panoramic view he's now bringing in, it's got this reach to the outside world. Sea, hill, and wood. And now again, repeated with many conjunctions. This is called uh, polysyndeton. It's, it's often used to uh, draw out a certain sense and to create a, a sense of being overwhelmed. Or, and here it's working as informing the expansiveness of this scene that's surrounding the outside world. 
with all the numberless goings on of life. It's goings on. Now remember how I said this was this this poem uses idiomatic language. Goings on of life. This is it's very consciously reacting against highfalutin poetic diction. And this is what the romantics were all about, countering this artificial, uh, this superficial expression in poetry, the goings on of life. That's a that's a phrase that's just made up of the texture of everyday life. And it's part of why he uses it here. Inaudible as dreams. Here we have this quietness. Inaudible. Silentness. The thin blue flame lies on my low burnt fire and quivers not. Only that film which fluttered on the grate. Notice how thin blue flame Three uh, monosyllabic words grouped together, they all receive the stress. So it's not perfect iambic, but it's heightening our attention by yoking it with those stresses. Thin blue flame. This is something that Wordsworth will do in Tintern Abbey as well when he comes to say uh, one green hue. Three monosyllabic words grouped together and all receiving the stress. This, this, this flame, this, this low burnt fire, this film which is fluttering on the grate, is important because um, sometimes you would have a film of soot on the grate before the fireplace and it would it would kind of flicker and flutter and this was called idiomatically a stranger and this will come up again in the poem and uh, usually when when you have it dancing like that uh, common folklore belief that it meant that uh, a stranger would come that this was a sign that you would be visited by uh, a relative perhaps or just a stranger so this is going to be important for uh, later in the poem, when the poet begins to shift. Now notice we have a visual shift here, and this is surprising. It's surprising because the sense is not completed. We don't have a period here. We have a comma. And so the poem goes on to complete the sense. Only that film which fluttered on the grate still flutters there, the sole unquiet thing. And this is another strange construction, unquiet not noisy, unquiet thing. Again, there's this strange otherness that's being projected onto that. And notice the modulation between verb tense, just as the owl's cry, which came from afar, and then hark again, it comes again, we have fluttered, verb. And then at this transition, he transitions into the present again, still flutters there, the soul, unquiet thing. This poem is happening. It's not a moment that had happened and now he's presenting reflections on it. This is a meditation that's happening in the moment and it's bringing us into the meditation itself. Methinks its motion in this hush of nature gives it dim sympathies with me who live, making it a companionable form, whose puny flaps and freaks the idling spirit by its own moods interprets. Everywhere echo or mirror, seeking of itself and making a toy of thought. So this verse paragraph here, this section, is latching on to this fluttering film um, as a symbol for thought. It's, it's a certain mood. Hush of nature in its motion seems to reflect something with him. It's a companionable form. It has sympathies with the speaker and its puny flaps and freaks, the idling spirit by its own mood, moods interprets everywhere echo or mirror. This is gonna be important. Seeking of itself and makes a toy of thought. So it's in this playful mood and it's interpreting. And then we have this break, moving on, a, a, a spatial break, but also suddenly an impassioned break in tone. But oh, how oft. This is a striking beginning of the next paragraph that, that Wordsworth will pick up and use in his poem. So hang on to this. But oh, this unpassioned thought, how oft, how oft repetition at school with most believing mind. Now he's moving back, reflection, a memory. At school, bringing him back to his school days with most believing mind. Presageful have I gazed upon the bars to watch that fluttering stranger. That's that film which makes a toy of thought. And as oft with unclosed lids, already I had dreamt of my sweet birthplace and the old church tower whose bells, the poor man's only music, rang from morn to evening. 
all the hot fair day, so sweetly that they stirred and haunted me with a wild pleasure. Falling on mine ear, most like articulate sounds of things to come. This is what he means by presageful. He has a feeling that this uh, is prophetic. That the film on the great is signaling that, oh, he will have a visitor too. And it's making him recall his home. This is a key phrase, believing mine, both for Coleridge and his predecessors. It comes partly from Spencer, Jeremy Taylor, who will use this phrase. He's remembering how sad he was in school days. Notice too this wild pleasure associated with his boyhood days. This will come back up in turn, Tin Turn Abbey. Of course, Wordsworth uses it differently, but this wild pleasure being associated in boyhood or in an immature state is something that Coleridge and Wordsworth both will use. So gazed I till on, till the soothing things I dreamt lulled me to sleep, and sleep prolonged my dreams. Moving up. And so I brooded all the following morn, awed by the stern preceptor's face, that's his schoolmaster, our school teacher, mine eye fixed with mock study on a swimming book. He's pretending to read a book while his teacher is watching him, save if the door half opened and I snatched a hasty glance, and still my heart leaped up, for still I hoped to see the stranger's face. Again, just to belabor the connection between Wordsworth and Coleridge during this period, uh, Wordsworth will write a poem in 1802 that begins with this line. My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. Again, they're, they're, they're really creating their own lexicon, their own institution of poetry by which they reference in each other's poems. So Wordsworth will be doing the referencing. Here it comes up in Coleridge. So he's, he's remembering how when he was a boy, he would be pretending to read, hoping to escape. He, he's wanting to break out of something. And many of these greater romantic lyrics are trying to break out of a certain psychic state and to achieve a new state of consciousness of um, acceptance of the world. Notice too this this lulling effect with the L sounds lulled me to sleep and sleep the repetition prolonged there's that L again my dreams and the long E in E in dreams of course repeating the long E in sleep repeated twice here. So he's pretending to read he snatches a glance at the open door for still I hope to see the stranger's face believing that that film on the great presaged the coming of a townsman or aunt or sister more beloved, my playmate when we both were clothed alike. And then we have this shift moving down. Dear babe, I suddenly he's addressing something. Odes will address someone or something outside the poem, just as the greater romantic lyric will do. This is a key moment in this genre. Uh, there's this reflection and then a therefore, an application. Here the application is in form of a benediction. Dear babe, remember the one sleeping silently, who, whom he can hear breathing in the cradle as he's lying awake in the present moment. Dear babe, that sleepest cradled by my side, whose gentle breathings heard in this deep calm fill up the interspersed vacancies and momentary pauses of the thought. My babe so beautiful, it thrills my heart with gentle gladness thus to look at thee, and think that thou shalt learn far other lore and in far other scenes. So having reflected on his own childhood, he has higher hopes for his own son, uh, who happens to be Hartley, biographically, but here the infant babe. For I was reared in the great city, pent mid cloisters dim, and saw not lovely but the sky and stars. But thou, my babe, shall wander like a breeze by lakes and sandy shores, beneath the crags of ancient mountain, and beneath the clouds, which image in their bulk both lakes and shores, and mountain crags. Now does this turn to you? This is how I lived. This is your, this is going to be your education, your childhood. You'll wander in the breeze by the lakes. Of course, Wordsworth, too, picks up on this in Tintern Abbey, as we'll see when he turns to address Dorothy, the sister, the dear, dear friend. Let the misty mountain winds be free to blow against thee, he will pray. But here, Coleridge, breathing the benediction to his son. Uh, notice that mirror, too, the fluttering still thing um, that mirrors and makes a toy of thought. Well, here we have the water mirroring the landscape in this imagined scene in the future. 
so shalt thou see and hear the lovely shapes and sounds intelligible of that eternal language which thy God utters. Nature for Coleridge is very much the language of God, and it always has been, um, even in his younger, more heterodox years when he was a Unitarian. He has this view of nature as the book of God. When Coleridge becomes a Trinitarian Christian in his later years, nature will, will carry the same resonance for him, but really it also kind of expands by virtue of that Trinitarian theology that Coleridge will just be taken with. But nature for the babe, for Hartley, who's being addressed, will be a religious experience. Nature is that eternal language which thy God utters, who from eternity doth teach himself in all and all things in himself. This is very different. See, he's actually using the word God here, whereas the other greater romantic lyrics will not so much. Uh, Wordsworth seems to be at great pains to avoid the word God, um, although there is the ghost of God in some of his, his poems. Keats and Shelley are not very interested in the Orthodox God in the way that Coleridge is. He's, he's very much interested in nature as a revelation, as a second Bible, as he calls it, and himself in all things and all things in himself. Notice this apanalepsis here or an encircling where the same word is repeated at the beginning, or repeated at the end of the line, as it was in the beginning. And so it's really enclosing himself in all, and all things in himself. This line really contains that circular, that rondure. God, who is the great universal teacher, he shall mold thy spirit, and by giving make it ask. So in a way, nature will cause Hartley's heart to inquire of the God of creation, and it will lead him to God eventually. And so that's really the hope, the prayer that Coleridge makes for his son here. Moving down, we have this very logical, therefore, very important in poetry, very important for the greater romantic lyric. Therefore, for this reason, all seasons shall be sweet to thee, whether the summer clothe the general earth with greenness, or the red breast sit and sing betwixt the tufts of snow on the bare branch. Beautiful monosyllables here, just resounding with iambic rhythm of mossy apple tree, while the nigh thatch smokes in the sun thaw, whether the eavedrops fall heard only in the trances of the blast, or if, you know, remember how the poems turn upon themselves at the beginning, or if the secret ministry of the frost shall hang them up in silent icicles. He finally gives us this, not silentness, but silent icicles, recreating not the distance or the, the frustration of expectation, but really a fulfillment and harmony of the scene. Of course, you have that beautiful sibilance here with the repetition of sounds, silent icicles. And instead of an unquiet thing, we have a thing quiet, quietly shining to the quiet moon. And notice how the beautiful marriage of audible sensation with the visible world, quietly shining. It's synesthetic. It's blending sight and sound together. And he's not shy of repetition either. It's a form of polypteton, the use of a, of a word with, a, with the same or similar root words. The mossy apple tree, something to note here. The bare branch, the nigh thatch. These are all words that will come up in Keats's Ode to Autumn. And, uh, also in the Nightingale, Eve drops fall. This is another two autumns. So you'll see how later romantics really build on this poem. And that's why I'm starting with this one. It's really not the inaugural poem, but it's one that will echo throughout the greater romantic lyrics to come. So I hope this was helpful. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, let me know in the comments if you have any uh, suggestions for later poems, or if you've noticed anything that didn't get mentioned. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you all in the next video.